Now would you turn to Hebrews chapter 3. I'll be reading Hebrews 3, 7 through 4, 2. I do end the reading in the midst of an argument that the author of Hebrews is pursuing, but I do so advisedly because I want especially to call your attention to that last verse I'll read, to verse 2 of chapter 4. Hebrews 3, 7 through 4, 2. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, Do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt by Moses, who who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, do grant us understanding of your word. Enable us to read, to mark, to digest, to profit from, to be strengthened by your word. According to your spirit's power, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Although the Reformation of the 16th century challenged in a profound way the cherished doctrines and practices of the Roman Catholic Church, it did not differ from the church in its high view of the scriptures as divinely inspired. There was a difference, of course, in the place of the scriptures We know that one of the battle cries of the Reformation was Scripture alone. But the Roman Catholic Church at least nominally held to the belief that the Scripture was the Word of God. This view of the Scriptures was held generally throughout Western medieval civilization during what historians call the Age of Faith. However, by the 17th century, there arose a growing confidence in the capacity of human reason to explore and interpret reality. The age of faith gave way to the age of reason, or as it is often called, the Enlightenment. As reason sallied forth to test all the time-worn assumptions about the world, the universe, and everything, It came to the Bible. And by the late 18th century, remember that's the 1700s, Bible scholars joined the fray and began subjecting the scriptures to what they understood to be scientific evaluation. 
men like Friedrich Schleiermacher in the late 18th century and David Strauss in the early 19th century weighed the scriptures on the scales of human reason and they believed them to be found wanting. The Bible reflected primitive, unscientific views of the cosmos, gross historical inaccuracies, and even backward morals. By the late 19th century, the leading biblical scholars had concluded that the Bible was completely unreliable as an historical document, especially with its exaggerated stories of miracles, appearances of heavenly beings, and especially its ascribing to God personal control of historical events. By the early 20th century, it dawned on their successors in the halls of theological academia that this approach to the Bible did not leave the Christian church much to believe. Hmm, what to do in order to keep our jobs? Well, by this time, the world had moved on from the Enlightenment and was coming to the end of the Romantic Age, where it was thought that emotions and passions could find meaning where reason had failed. Turns out that emotions and passions hadn't done so hot. So Western thought, having burned through reason and the emotions, turned to the, the last hope, the human will. It is perhaps only slightly flippant to characterize this progression in the following manner. If you can't figure out the truth with your reason and you can't feel it in your heart, then just make it up. This led to the philosophy known as existentialism. Truth and meaning were no longer believed to be the objective realities to be discovered. They had to be created by the mind and the will of the seeker. Having given up on the idea that the scriptures contain certain knowledge of things, like the nature of God, the nature of man, and God's dealing with man in history, men like Emil Brunner and Karl Barth sought to apply existentialism to biblical interpretation. They felt that this was a way to recapture the faith and restore meaning to biblical studies. They accepted the verdict of higher criticism. But they believed that the Bible could still speak. They accepted the, the decision that the Bible was not historically reliable. However, it could still speak to us in a meaningful way. And so while they stumbled over the traditional understanding that the Bible was the word of God, they believed that it could become the word of God to the hearer or to the reader. As one read or heard the scriptures, one might experience an existential encounter and receive profound insight. Now this insight might have little to do with the actual words of the text, but that was okay. What was important was what it meant to you. Is this starting to sound familiar? As David Wells has so masterfully demonstrated in his evaluation of modern evangelicalism, this method of approaching the scriptures, which was called neo-orthodoxy in the early 20th century, and whom all evangelicals knew was not a good thing, it has nevertheless become commonplace in much of evangelicalism today. The real question, as one reads the Bible, is, but what does it mean to me? I'll never forget the conversation I had with a visitor to a Bible study we had at Calvary Presbyterian Church in Harrisville, Ohio. And <clears throat> this visitor who had been brought by a friend uh, was confronting me about my Calvinistic belief, and uh, especially I believe we were arguing over 
uh, Romans 8 and over those that he foreknew, he also predestined. And he said, I think that means that God knew ahead of time what we were going to choose, and therefore on the basis of that, he chose us, whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Well, this, of course, was the standard Arminian argument, and having, you know, braced myself with my studies and uh, seminary and so forth, I was prepared to answer it, and so I told him that foreknew there uh, does not talk about, it's not talking about God gathering information and learning things and finding things out that he didn't know before. Uh, that is talking about God having set his love, having actually chosen us and those he chose in love, he predestined. And <clears throat> so uh, he said, well, he says, yeah, I think I know what you mean, but you know, that's what it means to me. That was his refuge. That's what it means to me. So even though he had been clearly shown, it did not mean what he thought it meant. He still could say, but that's what it means to me. And this was an evangelical Christian. What is going on here? Is the desire of people who now look to their dreams or pick up, say, a book like Jesus Calling, which purports to be sayings that have been uttered directly by Jesus to the author and that she then turns and shares with uh, everyone? Um, but is that desire, hoping to get a personal word directly from the Lord, understandable? False teachers have led many astray by taking advantage of this desire. People want to know the Lord. They want to know that the Lord knows them. They want to draw near to him. These false teachers have taken advantage of that, and they have done so not only by denying that the scriptures are historically reliable, but that they are, they've denied that they're God's supernatural revelation to his people. They deny that in the scriptures, God speaks to us. He not only speaks or has spoken to those of old, but that he is speaking to us, to each of us in his living word. This is why I have a particular interest in the surrounding description in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Because if you look closely at it, it's a bit odd. We see here Moses is employing this truth that God is speaking directly to his covenant people in the scriptures. That's our first point, and we're going to spend some time on it. God speaks directly to his covenant people in the scriptures. Deuteronomy 5, look again at those opening words. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. Now, Stopping at that time, at that point in the text. Remember where we are here. This is 40 years later, 40 years after the liberation from Egypt and the first giving of the Ten Commandments, when indeed God did speak to the nation of Israel. He spoke all the words from the mountain. We remember the response of the people at the time, the terror that they felt, and their request of Moses that he be the one who hears these words and then come and be 
act as the first prophet to tell them the words of God. This is 40 years later, and God has made a particular provision for destroying the generation that had stood before him on the mount 40 years before. The very purpose of the wandering of 40 years in the wilderness was that that generation might be punished, might pass away, and not enter into the promised inheritance because they had not believed in the Lord. They had hardened their hearts. They had refused to obey. And so we go on with verse 2. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. All right. Made a covenant with us. That's a bit of a stretch there. We're beginning to wonder. Got a 40-year gap here, remember. He's talking about back the first time. That's the event Moses is describing here. The first, when the Ten Commandments were given from the Mount, 40 years before. Then... He says explicitly what we were afraid he was going to say. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here alive today. How could that possibly make sense? No, the people you had made that covenant with are strewn or buried in the desert. We're their children and their children's children. And yet Moses insisted deliberately. Moses, who we remember, his eye did not dim. He was not, he was not senile. He wasn't losing it. He knew exactly who he was talking to. And yet he insisted that it was not with their fathers God had made this co covenant, but he had made it with them. He is making it with, with us who are all of us here alive today. And so he goes on. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain out of the midst of the fire. Of course, they were not there. This generation to whom he is speaking at this time is not physically present. They were not physically present back then. And yet Moses speaks to them as if they were. Very clearly, the fathers that are in mind, in Moses' mind as he says this, were not the patriarchs. There are some who have sought to interpret this passage in this way, trying to make sense of it. Oh, Moses must have been talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And uh, there were some aspects of the covenant that were added to and were a little bit different uh, with the Israelites as a nation uh, than with the patriarchs. And so um, Moses is talking about some of, the, uh, some of the additions that are made to the covenant. Yes, it's substantially the same covenant, but there are enough adjustments in it, uh, enough things about the nation of Israel uh, that... Um, he must be talking about, no, it's not the patriarchs, it's you, Israel, today. But the way he goes on and speaks of it, and he speaks of this generation who are the children of those who were originally addressed from the mountain. And the fact that he speaks of them, he says, the Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain out of the midst of the fire while I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of God, the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and you did not go up into the mountain. That and everything that is said after the Ten Commandments shows that Moses is treating his hearers as one with the people that he had previously made this covenant with. This covenant was made with you. And ultimately, I am saying that this applies 
to you right now who are living today. This is how God speaks to his people. The infinite eternal God who knows the end from the beginning and who knows all of his people down through the ages whom he has chosen has designed a way as only God can to speak his living word directly to each generation of his people as they go by. uh, There are a number of places in which this phenomenon is behind the way the scriptures are treated. We especially see it when an Old Testament passage is resorted to in the New. Other times we see the, uh, the Old Testament referring to something previously. And, and it uses it, it can only be understood in this way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 is one passage that, that, um, that relies upon this truth, upon this reality. When it says that those who, <clears throat> who turned aside to idolatry uh, in the desert and all of the things that happened as they wandered through the wilderness, as they, as they questioned the Lord, is the Lord among us or not, and rebelled against him. And he says, they were, they happen as examples to us. The actual word there is type. And it would be more literally translated, they were types of us. They were types of us. They were those who foreshadowed us. They were connected to us. The reason why what was said to them applies to us now is there's a connection between them and us. We are all God's people. And the things that God spoke to them back then are applicable to us today. We don't have to, in some artificial way, apply things to ourselves as we see fit, but rather God means you when he is speaking to his people. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 give us an example of this. It's a very easy one to grasp. I've um, looked at it on previous occasions. Just look there for a moment just to see what I'm talking about. This is the only phenomenon that could possibly make sense of this is that God has all of his people in mind as he speaks his word. And he means it for each one of them as well as for all of them together. Uh, We read in 13.5, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And where does that come from? comes from Deuteronomy and it comes from Joshua chapter 1. In one case Moses uh, says it to Joshua. He gives him that promise. You're going to be able to lead Israel because the Lord has said I will never leave you or forsake you. So how could we take this phrase uttered on two occasions to an historical figure, Joshua, and just willy-nilly apply it to ourselves. That's exactly what the biblical author does here. He says, you can be free from the love of money because he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then he tells them that we are to appropriate that promise for ourselves so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Oh, so we're even able to personally appropriate those things that are said in the Psalms to David. Not only are we to do so because it makes us feel better, but because they were addressed to us. Yes, you who are living here today. God speaks these living words to you. I suppose you could call it an existential encounter and that it is real, but it's the same one 
And it's the one he intends, not the one that we imagine. It's the meaning he intends. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, back to our passage. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Um, Hebrews 3, Hebrews 3, verse 7 to 4, 2. Note that verse 2. For good news came to us just as to them. You see the connection there. Good news, the gospel, came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Now back then, who were those who listened? Well, Joshua and Caleb for two of them. Um, Aaron, Moses, a number of others who did listen. And, of course, Joshua and Caleb were vindicated even after the wilderness wanderings. They listened. There, again, is, uh, has been debate about how this verse is to be interpreted. And I don't ordinarily go over all the possible translation possibilities, but because it occurs so often, and it's such an important point, I'll make a point of it here. There are those who would translate this something like, they did not combine with what they heard, faith. In other words, there, there's, you're combining two things here in this passage. Is it what they heard with belief in what they heard? Or is it the people who did not believe were not combined with the people who did believe? The most straightforward translation is the latter. They were not combined with those who did believe, who did listen, who did heed. And actually, in, in terms of the entire context, everything <coughs> about this passage is talking about the unity of the people of God in their faith, that they all together are to believe in him, that they are to identify with those who belong to the Lord and who trust him by faith. It fits with this entire idea of God's people throughout the ages being united by faith. Are you in or are you out? Are you with them or are you not? Are you one who trusts God or are you not? Now we know that only those who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ are those who are God's people. That's our second point. God's covenant people are those who believe in the gospel of Christ. Note verse 314. We have come to share in Christ. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Now, what is assumed here is all that has gone into our sharing in Christ. The Son of God becoming flesh, that he might come to seek and to save the lost. His life of perfect righteousness, his sacrificial death, his resurrection from the dead. All that sinners might be forgiven, for he paid their debt and justified because God reckoned his righteousness to them. And how do sinners come to share in Christ? They hear the good news of the gospel. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. They show that they have come to share in Christ by persevering in that faith, by uniting in faith with God's people who trust in him. And it is a faith which heeds God's word. 
And so we see again in this whole passage the use of Psalm 95. Today, if you hear his voice, well, that today, from the perspective of the author of Hebrews, was written a thousand years before. And it was referring to historical events that had taken place hundreds of years earlier. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah and Massa, when the people rebelled against the Lord and as a result, their bodies fell in the wilderness. They did not join with, they were not united with those who heeded God's word and trusted him. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Later on, David is able to use that command as if it were given to him for the Lord's people in his day, because it was. And the author of Hebrews is able to take the very same passage of scripture and he is able to address it to the people who were alive in his day. And I today am able to take Psalm 95 and say to you, for God intended for me to say to you today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Hear and heed. You can do so because you have come to take refuge in Jesus. You can hear God's word because God has granted you faith through the power of the Holy Spirit sent by our Lord Jesus. And so all of this is so vitally important because the third point, heeding God's word is essential to eternal life. Heeding God's word is essential to eternal life. Eternal life is defined by our Lord in John 3, uh, rather John 17, 3. He says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It makes it very clear there that eternal life is not just a matter of endless existence in whatever condition. But it is, the, the emphasis is not so much on the, the, uh, the quantity, so to speak, the, uh, the co- quantity of years, quantity of eons. Uh, there is, it, it would be improper even to speak of quantity because quantity always has a limit and it's forever. The emphasis, however, is on the quality. What defines eternal life? Life is the knowledge of God, that intimate personal knowledge whereby we are related to him. He is our father. We are his children. The very design of the family and the intimacy of the relationships within the members of the family were meant to show us just how close God means for us to be to him. And so eternal life is to know him to be known by him. How is that knowledge to come about? God speaks to us as a man speaks to his friend, as he spoke to Moses. Therefore, knowing that God is personally speaking to each one of us, as well as to all of us, is vitally important. How how is it that Paul who probably never even saw Jesus of Nazareth during his earthly life. How is he able to say that Christ loved him and gave himself for him? It's certainly not that eternal life and salvation had been set out like a smorgasbord and anybody who happened by and had the good sense to say, there's some pretty good things here. I'm going to partake of them. And perhaps 
Those who are running the smorgasbord managed to get their names down, uh, managed to identify some of them. Uh, no, that is not the way salvation works. God sent his son to seek and to save that which was lost. Again and again, Jesus makes it clear that he has come to save his people from their sins. John 10, verses 3 uh, and 14. Don't, don't miss the import of these. Jesus really meant it when he said these things. John 10, verse 3. To him the gatekeeper opens, that is, to the good shepherd. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, Jesus is not using an illustration here that is going to break down at some point when he applies it to himself. Just as the good shepherd knows his sheep by name, so I, the good shepherd, know my sheep by name. He says, indeed, in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. And when he would lay down his life for his sheep, he knew those for whom he died. Paul knew that when Jesus died, he was giving himself for Paul. He loved Paul and gave himself for him. That is true in the case of each and every one of us. Too often we think of limited atonement only in the total sense that Christ died for the elect. He died for the body of the elect. But he not only died for all, he died for each. Each one of you knew your names as he was on the cross and knew your names as he rose again from the dead. He gave himself for each of you. And so will he not have made provision for speaking to each one of you? He who began a good work in you, will he not complete it under the day of Christ Jesus through means of his appointment? This is a living word. This satisfies the desire to draw near to God personally for these are the words that he has spoken, intending them for each and every one of us and for all of us together as he calls us into his family. Parents of children of a family of 12 love each one of their children as much as one who, uh, as a family who has only one child or two. They love each and every one of their children with all of the shortcomings and of sin as well as of just being human. But we at least can grasp the idea that a parent would love each one of his children with all of his or her heart. Well, God loves each and every one of his children with all of his heart. The Lord Jesus loves each of his sheep with all of his heart, and he gave his life for them. And so, in the scriptures, he speaks to each one of you. You don't need Jesus' calling. You don't need dreams, which all are the product of an imagination, sometimes, was perhaps a somewhat sanctified imagination, but any true, genuine, reliable word of God is here. And it has come to us through the prophets and apostles. It has come to us through God's appointed means because it is his word. It is his love, which he means to communicate to us. And if we 
are to have an existential encounter with him. It is to be by his appointment. And so, brothers and sisters, read this word as it was intended to be read. As knowing that its author knows you. Knowing that its author has given you a message in it which is sufficient for all of your needs. Knowing that its author intends for you not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might be fit for life eternal with him. Amen. Let us pray.